All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, it's, it's been a little while since I've been to jailbreak. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, I didn't get a great night of sleep last night, so please bear with me if I'm a little discombobulated. Uh, talks are going to be great anyways, though. Uh, I want to start off by just taking a quick... Uh, if you've ever written a heap exploit, even in a lab setting, uh, would you mind tossing your hand up for me just so I can see in the audience like how we... Oh, wow. Yeah. A great audience here. Um, so I wanted to tell the story that motivated this talk. And it was the first time I ever wrote a heap exploit in a lab setting. Uh, there was a lot of GDB involved. There was a bunch of pointers sort of just fiddling around. And then eventually it worked. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. But also what just happened? You know, <laughs> like, I think it worked that time. I don't, don't ask me to do it again. Uh, <laughs> And that was the sort of thing that, that uh, really inspired me to do this talk and to do a lot of the stuff that I'm uh, working on these days. So who am I? Uh, Mark Griffin. I've been doing security research for a long time, uh, vulnerability research stuff. A lot, of, uh, a lot of work in the binary world, source world. Uh, now I'm doing my own thing, writing tools to help people do security research and also developers who just want to understand how software works and learn to do other things good too. Um, so. Before, uh, enough about me, let's get into it. Today, uh, we're going to talk about dynamic memory allocation, right? We're going to be talking about heap. It's in the slide. I'm going to talk about heap layouts, uh, a topic we all know and love, uh, as well as tools to help people understand them. Talk about some of my own experience building some tools and what I learned from that, and then share what I think is like the really interesting and valuable part, which is what came out of that, which is uh, visuals and patterns. And, uh, and how that's a tool in and of itself. So this talk is going to be focused on C generally, uh, but of course heap stuff translates broadly to many things. Uh, dynamic memory allocation is one of the biggest building blocks in C. If you're going to do anything non-trivial, you pretty much have to use it. Uh, so why is it so hard? Uh, I just want to start off by talking about this because it is kind of a funny thing to think about. Um, why something so simple is uh, such a big problem. So when we talk about foot guns, the best foot guns are the ones that almost anything can go wrong, and every time it does go wrong, it's a security problem. And that's what we've got here. Uh, you know, it should be a simple thing. You take some memory, you use it when you're done, you give it back. It sounds simple, but there's a lot of things you can actually screw up. Uh, forget to free it. You end up losing that memory. It could eventually lead to memory exhaustion. Uh, free too early, you get the use after freeze. Uh, forget you freed it, you get a use after free if you're lucky and you allocate it again or double free. Uh, lots of things can go wrong here. Uh, but that's not it, right? There's, there's even more. Uh, when you start to get into, OK, what if somebody is trying to mess up your code? Now you can get into some, some of the more fun ones. Uh, things like multiplication and size calculations. Who knew? But I think that the, the best part is not only are there so many different ways to mess up dynamic memory allocation, but where you mess it up and the impact that it has are often separated by time and space. So it's not like, oh, I messed something up, but luckily the program crashed, and it's right there, and I can see it and fix it. Usually it's like, oh, something blew up because something bad happened a while ago. Okay. That's helpful. So it, you know, it's, it's all a matter of perspective. But um, so generally speaking, these are sort of the, the categories that I use thinking about heap issues where out of bounds read and write is kind of the catch-up hole. Uh, because this could be like, OK, you index too far, or it could be that you just wrote outside of a block because it was, uh, or just like a random heap location because of bad pointer math, stuff like that. Use after free is a general category too. Uh, memory leak, in this case, there's kind of two kinds, and we'll talk about that. Double freeze and metadata corruption. And they're usually described with, with a diagram like this beautiful one. 
And you might think that that looks like it was from uh, the 90s or something, but that's actually from 2009, which I guess is 15 years ago now. But uh, diagrams like that, I love how much love and effort went into that, but I'm really not helped by them, unfortunately. I don't know, maybe I'm the only one. Uh, and I also want to talk about, uh, speaking of metadata corruption, uh, as far as allocators go, I'm going to try and not talk about specific allocators because I'm focused on broadly applicable concepts here. Because in general, allocators kind of do the same things. It's all about malloc, free, realloc, et cetera. So if we just can enable people to look at and understand the dynamics, then maybe they'll understand without needing to see all of the specific allocator, uh, what's unique to that one. And of course, when you get to the point where you have to care about that stuff, you know, do your research. But uh, this beautiful diagram in the lower left here is uh, somebody's diagram of what uh, malloc, free, and realloc look like if you just draw them out as a, uh, as a, a flow diagram. So basically, I'm trying to stay away from all that complexity. Because if, if we don't need it, we don't need it. Uh, you can't talk about heap exploitation without talking about this like vast variety of attacks, the house of whatever. I think house of bot cake is kind of my favorite name. But there's a lot to choose from. There's some good ones. Uh, you might ask yourself, why are these still around? Because these are still relevant. They still work today. And the reason is because they don't just work out of the box. You actually have to have some sort of memory corruption or at least allocator misuse beforehand. Uh, so they, they are allocator specific because each allocator has different ways of handling metadata and different ways of working. So again, I'm not going to focus on allocators. If you're interested in this stuff, though, the how to heap uh, repo on GitHub that Shellfish put up is excellent. It's a great way to learn about this stuff, but not the focus for today. But we, what we are going to talk a lot about is heap layouts. Because really, heap layouts is just understanding as you allocate memory, how does it end up being laid out? And sort of the, this, this first became a real big thing back in 2007. There's two kind of papers that became popular, uh, really focused on how to reliably manipulate heaps in order to make uh, exploitation easier. And this is where the difference in memory leaks that I talked about comes into play, where Nico Wiseman talked about a soft memory leak. So hard memory leak being the kind where, okay, we lost a pointer to it, it's just gone. Maybe that will eventually lead to memory exhaustion, but you can't use it very much. But a soft memory leak is something that an exploit writer would care about because it allows them to control the lifetime of some data. And of course, they, they would choose that data to be something that they want. But that, that sort of primitive is what enables them to write a heap exploit with a, a specific layout. So those are sort of the, the building blocks that we're starting with. Fast forward to today. Uh, because not, not that much has changed. This is actually a pretty simple idea. So this idea of manipulating layouts, it's not that hard. In fact, uh, a recent paper from just a couple years ago literally turned it into a game. They made a web app that they put in front of regular people that weren't you know, computer security experts, and they said, all right, here's the goal. And you can see that they've got different colors for different kinds of allocations. And they're like, you're trying to get the heap allocations to line up like this which is basically just set up the layout so that when you have this specific uh, bug primitive that you can land an exploit. And what they found was is that they were able to teach people how to do this without really teaching them like how a heap works because they could just watch patterns. I thought this was really cool. I couldn't find their code, uh, but I did get the screenshot. And so it's like, hey, maybe that's not a very fun game, but at least you could teach it to people, right? So that gives us some hope that it's not too complicated. Uh, some of the other more recent papers are really focused on sort of automatically detecting what you can do with the heap. So if you think of it as a weird machine, right, you can do different things. Understanding all of the different ways that you can uh, exercise heap allocations and freeze to set up a layout just the way you want it. A lot of interesting work being done in this area. People really trying to work towards the automated exploit generation for heap bugs. Uh, some cool stuff being done. But really, this, this all boils down to two general things. And I'm focused on the manual aspect here. But uh, it, if, they, 
if technology progresses and this is where it's going, then like that'll be freaking awesome. But until we're there, we're still going to have to have experts who can read this stuff and understand it. And so the people are going to need to understand how to use these sort of levers as well as understand how the heat bug that they have in front of them is, is affecting things. So upshot here for heat layouts. But heat bugs, as I talked about, being separated in time and space, depending on sort of what happens after a you know, out-of-bounds read, write, use after free, et cetera, um, what happens downstream affects how it's going to manifest. And that manifestation is mostly determined by the layout. So if you're trying to write an exploit, you need to understand the layout. If you're trying to diagnose a heap exploit because you got this like random crash that happens like 1% of the time, understanding the layout can actually help you, you know, rewind back to where the root cause is and understand that. But this, this talk, again, is just focused on this is something that's hard, but it's harder than it should be. It's not that hard. Uh, a lot of tools have been written over the years to, to help with this stuff. And so the stuff that I'm writing is really inspired by this stuff. And I'm not saying what I wrote is the best tool. So I wanted to, to share this stuff. So if nothing else, like here's some good stuff. Uh, my particular favorite for a visual tool for understanding heap layouts is called Villic. It was, uh, uh, which I think is a portmanteau of visual alloc. Uh, uh, Whoppy Flappy back in 2015, way ahead of his time. Uh, so what I love about this is you can tell what's going wrong right away. Uh, if you look at the top of that diagram there, because time goes up in this, you see two overlapping chunks. And generally speaking with heap chunks, they shouldn't overlap. So something has gone wrong here. And that's great. But even better than that is that when you look at under the hood at how this tool works, it is ingeniously simple. It just uses L-trace. Like, that's all you need. So L-trace, you don't need anything. Like, you just have a binary, just L-trace. Boom, show me all the... Uh, related allocation syscalls, and it looks like this uh, fine terminal output in the lower left-hand corner here. That's genius. And in fact, he also wrote it so that you could, he had other DBI tools set up that could basically do the tracing that you wanted and then output, uh, output in the L-trace format. Genius. And then it just uh, generates HTML uh, based on a template off of that L-trace data. So really cool stuff. And also had this really smart idea that like, hey, we should also be able to annotate this stuff too. So I can like write myself notes or if I'm uh, programmatically exercising something, I can have stuff that ends up in the diagram itself. Super helpful. But again, I think that what's really powerful about this is that you don't have to think to, to locate the problem. To illustrate this, let's play spot the bug. Where do we think the problem is? Well, it's probably in that big red line right there. Right? So I, I, know that, I know that that's like tongue in cheek, but it's also very true. How many tools have you used where it's like they wouldn't give you the red line? They'd be like, nope, it's somewhere in there. Go find it. <laughs> right? We've been there. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is actually a, a double free. And so I don't know if you can see my pointer. Oh, it's real small. Do we have a laser pointer? Uh, pointer jokes, I love it. <laughs> All right, so the laser pointer's not working. But yeah, so that this, uh, this hash marked uh, box that says unknown in the middle there, in the middle of the red box, that is, that's a free on a chunk that is not there. And so that's what it's illustrating. This is great. This is exactly the sort of thing that we want with a tool, where we don't have to think much, it just gives us the answer right away, and we can get on our way. Uh, but to put it in context, Velik is written to do one thing very well, and that's to show us what's going on with the layout. So it makes it easy to see the layout. Uh, you can see a lot of things happening. If there's more stuff, then it just gets wider and, and taller, and you can just scroll through and see the parts that you're interested in. It's really good at showing allocator level stuff. So the double threes, the over, overlapping chunks, uh, which we saw, perfect. But it's also just focused on the allocator layer. So it doesn't show you why that overlapping chunk happened. It doesn't show you where that free got called in the context of the main module. And that's important data. Like if you're trying to figure out this bug or how to use it, you really want to know that stuff. And my big thing is I, 
I don't like bouncing back and forth between a zillion tools. I think it's better to like put all the information in one place. I can just hang out there, got all my friends and my, my information, and we can just go to work. Uh, so Villic is really great, but uh, there's always room for improvement. One tool that I think that everybody's heard of, but even I like am blown away that I forget about it from time to time, Valgrind. Valgrind is fantastic. It's been around for over 20 years. It is super robust. It's, it's DBI, so you don't need source. You can just run it on anything, and worst case scenario, it crashes, which does happen. But it's pretty robust uh, as far as DBI goes. Uh, and it supports way more architectures than I thought it did. I think that, like, it's, you'd have to check, but I'm pretty sure it supports Android. I don't think it supports Mac. Um, but it has a lot of stuff, you know, in case you were under the impression that it was just for x86 stuff. Um, it is super powerful. It's built to do exactly this kind of uh, heap problem identification stuff, or at least that's what the primary tool for it is for. It even has some cool old school visuals, like this one in the lower right-hand corner here. This is, uh, this is actually showing you the distribution. It's, it's kind of hard to see because it's small. But this is the distribution of bytes that have been allocated over the call graph. And so you can see which function has sort of allocated the most, and then you can see that distribution across each split. So bottom line is that this is super powerful stuff. I, I often forget about it. Maybe you do too. Uh, it doesn't have exactly what I want from it, though, which is probably my fault. I could probably learn how to use it better. But here we are. Project for another day. Uh, some, other, some other tools that I want to call out uh, just to sort of round things out here. Address sanitizer. If you have source and you're trying to kill heat bugs, address sanitizer is definitely the best thing. It is so good. Um, it gives you like, oh yeah, that thing, it was allocated here, you freed it here, you accessed it here, and here's all the source locations that those things happened at. And that's, that's about as good as you can ask for. Uh, but you don't always have source. The other, the other things that I see a lot of are debugger helpers. Uh, I want to give one shout out to this IDA plugin that uh, somebody wrote that has a good amount of features in it if you're an IDA user. Fortunately, I'm not. But uh, pretty much name your pwn focused debugger, and they've got heap helpers now. Now, those heap helpers are uh, helpful, but they usually look like this. And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time visualizing a large number of pointers in my head. It's a personal flaw, but uh, pointers and sizes are what dynamic memory allocations are all about, and they're basically impossible to hold in your head. So these text tools are really helpful for like microscope diagnosing specific things when you already understand what the general flow is, but they don't quite pop an intuitive idea of what's going on right into your head. Uh, the other things that I think are super helpful for heat problems are reversible debuggers, because you can say, oh, a crash happened. Well, let me just go back to where that, where that happened and you know, walk back pointers, walk back allocations, stuff like that. Obviously, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I would like to see more Linux support for reversible debuggers, in case anybody in the audience can help out with that. Just saying. Uh, so we talked about the tools that, that we've seen. Obviously, we liked what Villic was doing, but we want a few more things. And so here's, here's the goals here. Like Fundamentally, understand heat dynamics in an intuitive way. Like I don't want to have to think really hard about it. It should just be obvious. Uh, I really want to understand the reads and the writes because like, that's the sort of stuff that leads to the allocator problems down the line that, that Villick shows well. Uh, I also need to understand code locations because it's like it's one thing to say, hey, your, your heap buffer got overflown, but it's not helpful if you can't tell me where that happens. And we also want heuristics. So heuristics, uh, both in the sense of I want to be able to programmatically detect these things and be warned so I can have that red line that says, hey, look right here, this is the problem. Uh, but also heuristics visually, because that's what the sort of pattern matching idea is, is like training ourselves to look here, see the problem quickly without having to think too much. So I had this idea to build a tool. I called it Trout, which was, uh, anybody get the reference? Thank you. Love it. So in case you haven't read the book, it's about uh, a Tralfamadorian. It's an alien species that experiences reality in four dimensions. And so they say, think of it like instead of 
seeing the world in 3D, they see it in 4D. So instead of seeing a person, they see that person as a long line of person-shaped things that starts with a baby and ends with an old person. Or they see time like we see mountains progressing. And I, I liked this idea. I, I actually felt like this was sort of the thing that we were trying to communicate here. Uh, so this is naturally going to use a time travel kind of concept to get us this information. And this is very attractive to us because it's reversible time travel. Uh, it doesn't change. One of the most annoying things uh, that happens with heap data is that the addresses change every time, and there is some non-determinism in play, So, or in many programs there is. So things don't always go exactly the way, uh, they don't go the same way necessarily from one run to the other, and that's it's problematic for understanding. So instead, I built something using Binary Ninja and Tenet, a Binary Ninja I'm sure everybody is aware of. Uh, you could definitely do this with other backends. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, so Tenet is a tool written by Marcus Gazelin of RET2. He's here today. Um, inspired by Kira. This was supposed to be a GIF, I'm sorry. Uh, but anyways, the idea is you can slide through these, uh, these indexes on the side here, and you can see the sort of instruction play move. So this idea is that we're just going to trace every instruction, see every memory and register access. So you can see like these red registers. These were the ones that were updated in the last instruction. This is a super cool idea, and I love that it was integrated in IDA because I love the idea of using a reversing framework as your front end, super smart. Um, but this also is a, an analysis tool. It relies on getting solid data from tracers. Uh, so a tracer is like DBI or full system emulation, or whatever you have, you can just record anything where you can record every instruction, you could do this. But the problem is, is that if those tracers aren't perfect, then your data's not perfect, uh, which I discovered was more of a problem than I thought later. But, I mean, it sounds like a problem up front, but I, I thought it would be better. Uh, so how do, you, how do you start from that? So uh, Tenet is focused on instruction traces, so you've got instructions. Uh, the next thing that we would want to build off of that in order to get our Vilic style L-trace data is we want functions. So we need to turn that instruction trace into a call trace, so a call stack. And so this is what, like, a call stack of a trivial Linux program looks like. Uh, we want to find the function calls, extract out arguments and uh, return values because that's the L-trace L -trace data. And if you're going to do that, you might as well write like a generic function hooking uh, capability, which is uh, a good idea for a lot of things. And it also allows you to handle a couple of the, the hairier problems like uh, multiple allocators. You might have something that has its own allocator in a, you know, corner of the code base, I've, I've seen, excuse me, I've seen diagrams where people like charted out the five different allocators that were in a program. And it's like, yeah, so this is the sort of thing that you'd want to be able to do where you can actually point at all of the different allocators and then target them separately or target all of them and show them all together. Uh, but again, to, to write Vilic, you kind of have to do a heap simulator uh, where, you're, where you're saying, okay, this was the malloc call and here's the corresponding free call or to say that there was never a corresponding free call. Basically, you have to write a heap simulator. And we're eventually going to want to detect issues with it. But just to start, you need to be able to do that stuff. And then the next thing is taking all those instruction traces, taking all the heap operations, understanding the blocks that come out of that, and then mapping all of the accesses to the blocks. And perhaps more interestingly, uh, the accesses outside of the blocks. Because the hypothesis that I had was, well, libc is kind of where the allocator lives. and Allocator is probably the only thing that should be touching things outside of allocated space, right? It seemed like a reasonable assumption to make. But the reality is, is that libc is naughty, and it does more out-of-bounds access as you might think. Uh, and again, problem with the tracers, it's, it's, it's a problem. It, uh, if you miss any data, you're going to miss accesses, and you're going to miss problems. So this is, uh, again, a problem with tracers, not tenant itself. If you were going to use a different backend, you'd have a different set of problems. But so, for example, if you go into a syscall, if memory changes in that syscall and you don't have a record of it, well, you're going to have an incomplete picture coming out of it. And that's that's kind of a serious flaw. And so, again, this this tool is an experiment, not not something to uh, be the end all be all. Uh, so, what do we have, and what are we going to show at the end of it after we put all that together? We've got block lifetimes, we've got memory accesses into the heap. 
We've also got other important data, and this is really where the Binja integration came in, because you really need to take that instruction trace and be able to overlay it onto something with Ida, like Ida, Binja, Ghidra, and get stuff like, uh, what, where does this offset map to? What is the call stack? What are all of the, the uh, frames in the call stack up to this point? And then be able to do things like highlight errors and allocations. We, we want that data to be really obvious if we're going to display it. And so here's, here's a simple example. We're going to start small and work our way up. So this is a simple uh, sort of hello world heap thing that shows how heap allocators are last in, first out, or at least the user, the glibc allocator is. So the idea is we show different events as colored rectangles based on sort of the size of the event. And then uh, we can visualize the blocks and the activity within them. So this just shows three blocks being allocated, one, two, three, successively, and then writes into those blocks, one, two, three, successfully. And then they're allocated if this is uh, if this is one two three, they're freed and three one two, and then reallocated. Oops, in exactly that opposite order. So you can see that pattern, right? And that sort of visual pattern is exactly what we're looking for. Uh, the purple line here, this is a sort of a, a meta thing. This is where you could do things like demarcate. Hey, this is where input came into the program, or this is where printf was called and something interesting was printed to the screen. That sort of thing. Uh, but if you have like a little bit less of a toy problem, there's, there's challenges with visualizations. I don't know if you can see this as well, but there's little tiny rectangles down here that indicate the scale of the memory reads and writes. And as your heap blocks get really big, those memory accesses are really small. But again, what, what the advantage of, of visualization is, and so this is just a basic uh, HTML page with D3 JavaScript to give it some interactivity and sort of uh, programmatically lay out these rectangles. Uh, but so when you click on these things, it, I, you know, put a basic information pane so that when you click on any one of the rectangles, you can see, okay, this was, this was the instruction pointer when that happened. This was the backtrace when that happened. If it's in the main module, we'll show what the offset was into the main module. And we can just like hop there in Binary Ninja. This is the start and end of this access. Here's the size of the access and here's like what actually was contained in that, right? So this is starting to get us like all of the information that we want. And what's nice about this is that it doesn't change from run to run, right? Bonus for time travelers. Uh, but this is, this is a conscious decision because there's actually another paper that sort of said, hey, what if we just visualized everything that has to do with a, a program running? So they showed the instruction pointer, they showed the stack, they showed heap memory accesses, and they showed it all in one big picture. And the problem with that is it's just way too much stuff. When you're looking at these things, you don't want all of the detail up front. I mean, the, the conclusion that they came to at the end of that paper was, this is a great visualization. We just need bigger screens to show it. I mean, I love that con conclusion, but I, I don't think it's really the answer. Uh, so yeah, the, the trick with this is, is to show exactly what needs to, needs to be shown up front so you can quickly figure out what's going on and then give enough information so you can drill down. So the, the real tool here is understanding quickly. Like I said, heuristics. So both visual and programmatic. So there's some programmatic uh, heuristics built into this because when you're writing this kind of tool, it's pretty easy. Like you have all the information about the heap. You can say, okay, these, these sort of classic heap problems, we can see them and point them out like right when they happen. Uh, out of bounds reason and writes, really easy, except when you have a out of bound read write that lands in another valid block. That gets to be harder. You can still find stuff like that, but it would require more work. You have to start to look for um, code locations. You could, with, with this level of information, the cool thing is, is that you can do things like say, where did that pointer come from? Is that pointer the result of arithmetic or was it stored somewhere? And you can start to walk that dog. You could do things like say, where are all the locations in code that these different objects are accessed from? And then you can start to see, okay, is there one that stands out? Like, okay, you just reached into this, this block from this code location that's abnormal from all the other ones that access that block. You can start to build those heuristics, but they're definitely more involved. Improper allocator behavior, again, that's sort of downstream of any, any like small problems. 
And so it's pretty easy to detect uh, that it sort of just follows from having, having a heap simulator. Basically, if you understand the idea of a heap, you can say, hmm, you just allocated two blocks in the same place. That's not right. Uh, use after freeze, also very easy because it's you know, basically an out of bounds read write except on, along the time axis instead of the, uh, the address access, uh, axis, unless, again, that block gets reallocated and now you have another valid block. But same story. We can start to do code trending, uh, code location trending. Uh, if, you, if you have that exact problem and you know what you're looking at, now you can start to filter it. Let's say you have a use after free. And this use after free, the same block, uh, the same object gets allocated like 90% of the time. What you need to do is get a trace of that 10% of the time and then say, okay, I know that this is the, like this is where my target uh, object gets freed. And then I need to watch this slot. And then when something else gets allocated there, I want that code location. And so now you can say like, okay, that code location where the allocation happens and the, uh, um, the reads or writes that are sort of the use after free in that case, then you can understand uh, why that happened. And so that's how you could go back from a valid, valid block access and get back to understanding your use after free. So again, this tool is just focused on simple heuristics, but this idea totally encompasses a lot more. So let's, let's try to, to make this a little bit easier, a little bit more audience participation. Shake it out. Uh, YouTube. It's fine. Uh, we're going to play visual recognition. So please, if you see, we're going to have some diagrams. And again, uh, this, was, this was the legend. The dark blue rectangles are the allocations. This uh, sort of body here is the block. Brown is uh, uh, writes and green is reads. Light blue is freeze. Figure out what's going wrong here. This is the first one, so I'm going easy on you. I'll give you some hints. These red bars are where the problem is. <laughs> the first red bar is probably where we should start. It's a double free. I didn't even plant them. I didn't. See, it already worked. Uh, yes, it's a double free. So this is, this is actually a really cool example because this was the House of Bot Cake demonstration that came with the, the How to Heat repo. So again, these house of whatever uh, techniques are focused on the allocator because it's uh, metadata corruption for exploitation, but they always start with a vulnerability primitive. And so that's what we're looking at here. If we, I did this right, yep. This code, I don't know if you can read that, but right here, there's two comments that says vulnerability before and after. And that is pointing right at our double free. And that's exactly what we'd want to see. And because down here we have this, uh, we have this error that says no matching block to free, very helpful there. Uh, we also have the friendly backtrace, and we can map that back to the location in main where this free was called, all that stuff. You start looking right there, and you find the vulnerability immediately. Don't have to read any of the code. That's the kind of thing we're looking for. Even better, uh, we can see that these two out-of-bounds reads that happen right here, they also correspond to these reads right here. And even more, we can see the reallocation, this blue block here. We can see where this reallocated uh, uh, block gets memset. And then we can see these, uh, these two, this write and then a read at the end. So that's exactly the sort of thing that we're looking for here. Again, the pattern is what's important. I think this visual recognition thing is is really cool. And so if we go back to our heap problems, this is a free and a, or this is a, a, a double free and then sort of a use after free because it's uh, these, these two accesses right here. Just pops right out. All right, next one. Again, the red bars are the hints. Um, ignore this one. Don't worry about this little guy. Out of bounds, right? Thank you. Okay, so this this comes from a classic CTF style problem where you've got the off by one right null byte. So if you have telescopic vision, you can zoom in right to the bottom here, 
And not only can you see like, hey, this is, this is the buffer that was allocated. I can click on that, see where that buffer got allocated. I can see this is the backtrace to where that happened. And again, because I have the instruction pointer, I can rewind and say, this is the exact instruction that that off by one right happened at. And I can even see, again, with my super telestop, telescopic vision, you see there's one null byte being read there, or written there. And that's, that's sort of just bringing it all together. So uh, this, is, this is a weird one, but it should be an easy one. There's two red bars. The second one is sort of the more interesting one, in my opinion. This part right here is a hint because these blocks have some opacity. Close. It's one of the things we talked about already. I need a legend. All right, so this, this blue, dark blue is an alloc, and it shows how large the block is that's being allocated. So this one right here, this is an overlapping chunk being allocated. So the idea here is that this block it exists, and then this shows the overlap right here. So again, this is, this is one of those things that helps if you can click on them and say like, okay, red bar, what do you mean? And then it just tells you. Uh, let me make sure. Oh, I didn't even give the... Okay, so if you clicked on that, it would say, error, block four overlaps block three. And then you could go back and see, oh, this is block four, this is block three. And then this, uh, this right here, again, is one of those... Uh, vulnerability uh, stand-ins where they say, all right, here's the vulnerability. We're going to change one byte or one word, and then it's going to allow us to do this overlapping chunk trick. So now you can say, like, okay, I see the overlapping chunks. It says that that's a problem, and I see this out-of-bounds right. That's also a problem. Perfect. All right, so trying not to beat a dead horse here, but this is, uh, this is one that sort of represents the name of the talk. This is probably pretty hard to see from out there, but these reads are slightly out of bounds on this buffer. I should have zoomed in more. I apologize. Uh, so this is your out of bounds read. So if you're talking about an info leak, this is the sort of thing that is very, very subtle. And the reason this happens, it's actually kind of interesting. So the reason this happens is because the data that's being read here, if you look down in the bottom here at this hex dump, you see 33 all the way to here, and then you see stuff that doesn't quite look like 33 anymore. And then if you go back to the, uh, I had this mixed up. This is the out-of-bounds read. If you go back, pivot to the previous right, you can see that only this many threes were written, but what's missing is your null, null terminator. So missing that null terminator here is what leads to that out-of-bounds read here. And so this is, this is your spot the leaks, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a more exaggerated example. So uh, just over 10 years ago, heart bleed was a thing. This is what that kind of bug looks like. You can see that there's uh, two buffers here where sensitive data is written. See that these writes. And then you see a third buffer come in where a little bit of data is written, and then a lot is read at this offset here. And so that, that's your out-of-bound read spanning multiple buffers in pictorial format. So again, spot the leak made easy. All right. So uh, I'm not going to quiz you on this one because I get it. We talked about soft leaks at the beginning. One of the things that most programs uh, should do but don't is free all their memory. If you look at the very end here, you can see all of the blocks that, uh, that haven't been deallocated, and you can go through those. If you have multiple runs, now you can start comparing across those and see, okay, which blocks are always leaked, and then which ones vary depending on the input. And so you can programmatically do this stuff. And that's, that's really where the juice is here, is, is enabling programmatic analysis and enabling visual analysis uh, manually. And so this is, this is your sort of soft leak visually and programmatically found. So what does this get us? Going back to the motivation here. This helps diagnose heat, heat bugs and understand layouts in general. If I can just show you a picture before you start debugging, you are going to debug so much faster. You're going to know where you want to look right off the get-go. That, that's super helpful. If you're learning how heap exploits work, because we all learned at some point, personally, this is the sort of thing I wish I had. Uh, and also reliability problems. This is probably the number one thing. Uh, if you've ever diagnosed 
a reliability issue for like a use after free or an out of bounds write, you might have run into the problem where something stole your slot. You had a slot, gonna put something good in there, but something else comes along first, takes your slot. And I don't know about you, but you might have had a heck of a time figuring out what keeps taking your slot. This is the tool that you want, right? You want the thing that says, hey, that was the slot you wanted, and this is where in the code something else got allocated. And then you can figure out like how to work around that. Is it possible to work around it? What can we do? That was really the big motivator. So going back to the tool, I'd say that this idea is very sound. Uh, there's a lot of details that you need to keep right. I would say that the approach I had wasn't the best, uh, but putting, putting information together was definitely the right thing. The heap simulator thing, uh, following in, in the footsteps of Villic, it works, but it's also brittle. Once something goes wrong, basically everything after that is tainted. So that, that's kind of a problem. It kind of forces you to narrow the scope. Um, and it's also, for this specific approach, you need to have all the accesses. If you don't have all the accesses, then you're going to miss something, and you're going to be really confused about what went wrong. Ask me how I know. Uh, I'll, but I will say that, that showing it with an interactive visual, I do think that that's the right approach. Uh, obviously, this was just a POC. Uh, there's a whole lot to be improved on it, but this, this was the right approach. I think that showing just enough to see the patterns with the ability to, to dig in and filter in on, on just what you want is a big deal. Obviously, this isn't, uh, I didn't show you any like horrific traces or anything. Definitely gets much worse. Uh, but I think that there's, there's promise in this approach. And in general, I think that heap layouts are exactly the sort of thing that our brains are bad at. And it's not our fault, all right? We need pictures. We're built to look at pictures. Uh, you know, who was, who was saying just recently, like, uh, or maybe it was a long time ago, uh, our, our brains are built to find fruit on the wild savanna, not understand heap layouts, right? So this, this approach is, is good, both for experts and for learners. And this is exactly the sort of work that I am focused on doing. I think that there's a ton of better ways to do it than what I just showed you. Like, again, it's just a, a POC. You need to keep experimenting. I know that someone will figure out better ways to do this stuff. Uh, but, and then that last point is important to me, too. I am all about building more into tools. Reversible debuggers, I think, are super underrated. They're not quite as robust, except for WinBag. Super robust. Uh, that sort of thing needs to be part of the arsenal, and it and it needs to be part of everything else. They can't be standalone tools anymore. So, um, I know we went through a lot today. I hope everybody enjoyed the comedic reliving of heap shenanigans. Uh, if you, I know that what I wrote is not the most helpful tool. Hopefully, these other tools that I shared. Uh, we're good. Hopefully you had a trip down memory lane or learned some things about papers to look at. Understood some of the challenges and vagaries of building on uh, uh, time travel or reversible things and then got to experience uh, really seeing some of these heap issues, which if nothing else, I hope that you walk away with a more intuitive understanding where you just say like, yeah, that wasn't bad. If I could see stuff like that, it'd be easy uh, because that's what I'm, I'm all about. So uh, at this point, we're going to stop and have questions. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, please find me afterwards. I have stickers or reach me on the interwebs. Uh, any questions? Marcus. Uh, one of the really interesting design decisions and differences is the fact that it's called a heap explorer for reverse engineering. For instance, I'm currently. Yeah, good question. So the question was, uh, the question was, I chose to show time going horizontally, whereas Villock and others show it going vertically. Honestly, I think it's a style decision more than anything else, but to me it made sense because uh, it's, you're, you're typically looking for patterns more horizontal than vertical. I feel like, again, a little bit of a taste thing here, but hear me out. If you have something that is uh, doing as much work as Trough was doing, you can kind of focus it to just where you care about. Because if, if, so one of the things that I did that I didn't really talk about 
is I start by filtering accesses based on heap pages. And so I can reduce that to just the pages where the errors happen. And so now I'm looking at a, a subset of the entire heap action. And that allows me to really focus the window. And if I'm going to focus the window, I prefer to scroll left to right. But that, that was one of the key takeaways, is that once you start doing these heuristics, it allows you to programmatically filter down. And then you don't need to worry about being able to scroll wide up and across. And if I had that choice for, for this kind of tool, I'd want to go left to right. If I had more time, I would rebuild it so that you could just click on the thing where it says, like, I don't know if it was super visible, but at the bottom it said there's like, if there's two errors, it said there's two errors. And here are the indices, like 12 and 72. And I'd want to make those clickable, so it just slides the thing over and shows you where that first one is. And I'd want to make all this stuff clickable, so you just click on it and it takes you to where in the trace like that. Like being able to pivot like you can in Tenet across this uh, trough style um, visual, I think would be powerful. Um. Why are the free bars not always the same size as the alloc bars? Ooh, that's a good question. Why are the free bars not always the size of the alloc bars? Honestly, that was, a, that was a conscious decision because free doesn't operate on sizes. It operates on chunks. And so the size of a chunk can be ambiguous. If there's two overlapping chunks that start at the same address, how big is the free supposed to be? Uh, so a little bit of a style decision. So I just chose to make it the minimum block size for that allocator, which is 16 bytes in this case. Uh, but so a little bit of a detail there that does kind of get you to think, wait, why does free not have a size? Okay. Do we need to take the mic for more questions? Got some more over here. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question, a great point. So the question was, how do you handle multi-threaded uh, allocations uh, because it can create a race condition? And so the answer is, is what I wrote does not handle that. Tenet is built uh, on single threads, and it doesn't have sense of timing, as far as I know, between them. Uh, so it can handle multiple threads, but it can't justify time. Uh, I think the way that I'd want to do that would be something like Winbag, where you can trace multiple. And then I'd want to have a hook of some sort that says, like, hey, when certain calls happen, go ahead and pop me a timestamp so I can reconcile those across threads. I think that that would be the best way to do it. Just right off the top of my head. How did you capture the heap program and free access? Like the reads and writes, because L trace would print like the calls for Alec and Free, but how'd you get like the little oh I read a bite, I I wrote a bite. Yeah, so good question. So the question was how did I how did I capture all of the accesses given that like L trace style data is just focused on uh, function arguments and return values? So the the answer was is that because uh, the, the tenant trace has every instruction. I was able to say, OK, show me every memory access. And this is what Tenet is built to do, and it, it is a pretty cool thing. Um, I can say, hey, any range of data, show me all of the accesses in that range. And then so I started with heap pages, and then said, OK, here are all of the access to heap pages, and then try to map those to blocks. Uh, but the secret is having a per instruction trace with every access. You have a lot of data, but you have that data. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.